How's that sound? Now, right, right as soon as I'm done, we're going to take a break. So those of you who uh, need to see the little sheriff's room uh, will be able to do that. Also, I failed to make uh, one other uh, clarification. Uh, some of you have maybe perhaps seen some, well, I'll just call it what it is, lies about me uh, in some periodicals. One is put out by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, we're in the middle of a lawsuit. I am suing the Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLC. Okay. Um, it's, already, it's already in court. It's not something we're talking about. We are, it's in court. Our lawyers are already wrangling back and forth. You know what lawyers do. Uh, also, one came out in the IACP magazine, and they, they quoted the Southern Poverty Law Center. They trusted the Southern Poverty Law Center. So my lawyers are talking to them and saying if they want to be party in the suit, they can keep that there or they can hurry up and apologize to me. Uh, so if somebody sneaked in from the SPLC, Southern Poverty Law Center, one of their little spies like they like to do, if you are in the room, you are trespassing. This is not a public meeting, okay? So if you use information from this, that will add to the lawsuit and it'll also add a criminal charge. And I will be filing a criminal complaint with the Gillespie, or Gillespie, Sheriff Gillespie or the Clark County or Las Vegas Metro, whichever one it is. I think it's actually both. So just a word to the wise. Now, I, I really like Michael's uh, presentation. What I really liked about this is he presented the Bill of Rights in a very practical way. And he kind of backed off from the Eighth Amendment. Now remember, that's the one that says no excessive fines or bail, nor cruel and unusual punishment. It was the one amendment that socked me in the face, just knocked me on my feet. When I was a rookie cop and I was discovering the Constitution and the oath of office, remember that thing? The little oath of office thing? You can't take your job unless you swear that oath. And you know why? Well, we're going to go over that in a minute. Okay? Where did that oath come from? Who were the crazies that made that up and made it a rule that I had to take an oath to support the governor and all the statutes of the state and to support the president? Oh, whoops, that's not what the oath says, is it? <laughs> The oath is to the Constitution. Who were the crazy constitutionalists that came up with that idea, huh? We're going to check that out here in a minute as well. But when I was trying to discover the Constitution, the Eighth Amendment was one that just knocked me off my feet. Because that made it me, me think that the billions, well, let's go millions, actually, do you, know how many, do you know how much money we make every year on radar tickets alone? seven billion dollars. Does that sound maybe like it might reach the point of Eighth Amendment excessiveness? Or how about the fine going towards the Sackett family that we saw at the very beginning because they were trying to build a home on their own property? How many amendments did that violate when the EPA comes in and says not only are we not going to allow you to build your home, we're going to fine you $32,500 a day for every day you're trying to. And that you don't restore the land as it was before you started. Now whose land was it? It was the Sackett family in Idaho. They owned it. They did the dastardly thing of trying to build a home on their own land. The, the black guy we saw earlier that said, the hole in the door is the least of my problems. That hole was put there by a federal SWAT team's foot. A SWAT team. Did you hear at the beginning what it was for? His wife, who didn't even live there anymore, hadn't paid her student loan. Do you think somebody ought to be protecting him from that? Well, he'll just have to get a lawyer. Why? When you're there. Why can't we just stop these problems before they start? I think it's a simple process. I swore an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution, specifically the Bill of Rights. And what's the, what's the real term for the Bill of Rights when it comes to government? They're the untouchables. Government cannot touch those rights. You can't legislate against them. 
You can't change them. You can't encroach upon them. And there's stalwarts out there, stewards of the Constitution, who have sworn an oath to protect our people within that framework of the untouchables. Thank God we don't have to keep that oath, huh? <laughs> we swear it. Can't take our job unless we do, but then we don't have to keep it. Really, that's what we're going to decide is if we do. Because I took a case all the way to the United States Supreme Court when I was sheriff. And let me tell you, I learned something about that system. I know that 90% of the, the people in, in America cannot even touch that system. They don't have the time nor the money to even reach, even think about reaching that system. And I had some national organizations get behind me or I wouldn't have been able to. It's impossible. And so you want to tell the citizens for their rights to be secure, go to the courts to an, a completely unreachable system for them. And so they go like this, oh, well, what can we do? And they go to their sheriffs and they go, hey, go get a good lawyer. And there's your justice system, America. Go get a lawyer and go ask the courts to take care of you. Do any of you really think that the Founding Fathers intended for our American system to be based on freedom, individual liberty decided by the United States Supreme Court? And that's the only place you can get it. I hardly think so. You know what you think about <laughs> when you're lying here? You know you're going to die. And you think, that's all right. You lived a long time. You had a family that loved you. You had a job that you thought made a difference, that you thought was honorable. And then you see this. I'm afraid if I dig any deeper, no one's going to like what I find. You took an oath. If you recall, when you first came to work for me, and I don't mean to the National Security Advisor of the United States, I mean to his boss. And I don't mean the president. He gave you word to his boss. He gave you word to the people of the United States. Your word is who you are. From James Earl Jones, okay? You gave your word to the people. You promised them in solemn oath. I challenge any of you to look at how the Founding Fathers viewed such an oath. You die before you allow that oath to be violated. That was their view. There's why we take the oath. The supreme law of the land requires it. Who wrote this? The founders of this great country required that the senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers both of the United States and of the several states shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. Let's remember we are sworn constitutional guards and who do we owe that oath and to whom do we owe that fulfillment? Of that oath, to the people of the United States. This is Article 6, last paragraph of the U.S. Constitution. You are required, we are required, by the supreme law of the land, to swear an oath of allegiance to the Constitution itself. Why did the Founding Fathers put that in there? Because it's another check and balance. That all three branches of government have the same purpose. And do we work, okay, let's make sure we know and understand that. 
Which branch do we work for? Are we legislators? Are we judges? We are the executors of the law. And what is the supreme law? <laughs> the Constitution. And what is absolutely to the tenth power the supreme law? The Bill of Rights. And if I see somebody in my county violating any of the supreme law of the land, I have no obligation to do anything about it, right? I don't have to do anything. I can just let them go right ahead. Well, I don't have the authority to keep my oath of office. I've actually heard that from some sheriffs in this country. I wish he were here today. He is not. I don't have the authority to keep my oath of office. The founders put that in here so all three of us, judicial branch, legislative branch, executive branch, are working for the same goal, uphold and defend the Constitution. Are judges supposed to interpret the law or are they supposed to do the same thing we're supposed to do? Uphold, defend, and obey the U.S. Constitution. They're not supposed to interpret. They're supposed to enforce. Okay? Big difference. James Madison called all of this that I believe that we're talking about today. He dwindled it all down into one word. It's in gold. Interpose. If you read right up above that, it says the state legislature is duty-bound to interpose its power to prevent the federal government from victimizing our people. There's your job. There's your oath. There's our duty. We interpose on behalf of the people to make sure that their rights are not being violated. That's all. It's a rather simple process. I admit it forces us to walk a fine line. But to find that line is exactly what we should all be talking about. Now this is Judge Roll. When, when we filed our court case, we filed on February 28th, 1994 in uh, Federal District Court in Tucson, Arizona. In the courtroom of one Judge John M. Roll. You'll recall, one year ago, January 8th, he was the Federal District Judge killed in Tucson, Arizona in that horrible rampage when Congresswoman Giffords was shot. That was Judge Roll. He changed my life. He was one of the most principled judges in American history. And he wrapped up in one sentence why I filed that lawsuit. Mac is thus forced to choose between keeping his oath or obeying the statute. My dear friends, as sheriffs, as peace officers, as county commissioners, whatever our jobs are. If we're ever put into that same quandary, what do you think we should put first? The statute or the Constitution and our oath to uphold and defend it? I chose the Constitution. I chose to side with the people in freedom. I chose to stand with the founding fathers who wrote this document. I told the federal government, no. And I sued them. And we won. Six other sheriffs from across the country joined that lawsuit. One from Texas, one from Mississippi, one from Louisiana, Vermont, Montana, and Wyoming. That's it. Seven. Only one from Texas. Sheriff Coog from Valverde County. Now, the Brady Bill was the issue at hand, and this was the first time in American history that sheriffs were commanded by the federal government to serve and work for them for free under a threat of arrest. There it is. That's in the Brady Bill itself. Under a separate provision of the Gun Control Act, that's the Federal Gun Control Act of 1968, any person who knowingly violates the section of the Gun Control Act amended by the Brady Bill shall be fined under this title, imprisoned for no more than one year, or both. That was the threat. We asked for an injunction from, from Judge Roll so that the federal government couldn't arrest me while we're in court. And we got the injunction over the objection of Janet Reno, who wrote a letter, a memo to the judge saying, this didn't really apply to the Cleos. What's a Cleo? Chief law enforcement officer. She said, this didn't really apply to the Cleos. Well, the Brady Bill calls the sheriffs the Cleos. So some people have asked, where do you see that anywhere? It's in the Brady Bill itself.
<laughs> Those of us, the litigants in the case, were sheriffs, and they called us the Cleos. Well, right there is where we got the injunction. Judge Roll granted the injunction and said that Janet Reno wasn't allowed to change this because she wrote a memo and that she doesn't get to interpret the law for Congress. We got our injunction. <laughs> this was against the Clinton administration. You know what? You look at all the people that sued the Clinton administration or Clinton, you look at all of that over and over. I was the only one to sue him on a non-sexual matter. You know? <laughs> yeah. those front seats. Y'all better make it light on yourselves and let me have those seats. This was uh, December 1st, 1955, Montgomery, Alabama. Knowing what we know now, Sheriff, Officer, knowing what we know now about equality, about the American dream, about what Badneric talked about, that we finally came to our senses regarding this horrible issue and this immoral act of controlling the body of another person believing that it was okay for quite a while in this country. Knowing what we know now about all men are created equal. Knowing what we know now about constitutional rights and my oath to uphold and defend it. You're the officer that gets on this bus. The bus driver calls the sheriff and he wants this person off the bus and he wants her arrested. And that is exactly what happened by officers who had sworn an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution. Now you and your deputy are called to this situation knowing what we know about America and freedom and equality. You're on the bus, December 1st, 1955, about 7 p.m., Christmas music playing in the background. What do you do? Do you haul this troublemaker off to jail? She was handcuffed, booked in, fingerprinted, photographed, booked into a cell. What do you do with her? Explain that to your constituents today. Give the answer. We're going to give the opportunity to maybe answer this on our survey a little bit later. But this is what I hope you would say. I would have gotten on that bus 
my deputy behind me, walked up to Rosa Parks and said, Ma'am, just what seems to be the problem here? And she looks up kind of shy because she thinks this is big trouble. And she goes, why can't we just be left alone? Ha! Huh. And that kind of gets to the sheriff. And he sits down next to her. And he does a crazy thing. He reaches over and shakes her hand. And he said, Mrs. Parks, what you did here today took a lot of courage. And it would be an honor for me and my deputy to escort you home safely. That, my dear friends, is a constitutional guard. That's a true oath keeper. What did that sheriff do with the law? Did he uphold the law? Yes, the supreme law of the land. The law of rights and equality and fairness. What did he do with the state law? He put it in the trash where it belonged. And he didn't have to ask anybody's permission, and he didn't need to go to court over it. He knew. What do we do with the same people today? Have we stopped putting people at the back of the bus? We just go from one group to another. Let me see if I can get this to work right here. They came with the director of milk control, and they all came and pretended they were just going to do an inspection, and then they did a seizure. It was a SWAT-type team raid, which included the FBI, the FDA, the CDFA, along with uh, half a dozen sheriffs. We were just recently raided again for the third time. Knock on the door, and my kids again ousted it from their bed. They terrorized the children, took the farmer away in handcuffs. They even took the sheep that I had brought over from New Zealand, and they took them out to Iowa and they killed them for a disease that doesn't exist to this day. Raw milk from South Carolina, USDA grade uh, licensed dairy, a uh, imminent health hazard according to the state of Georgia. America, wake up. I mean, uh, these things are starting to happen, and if we don't have a huge outcry, it will uh, continue to happen. And one of the things I think it's important to understand here is, it's beautiful. You know, and good food production should be aesthetically and aromatically, sensually romantic. Okay, this is uh, the first quote, the big one from the U.S. Supreme Court. This is Justice Scalia who wrote the decision in this case where two small town sheriffs made it all the way to the Supreme Court. We have held, however, that state legislatures are not subject to federal direction. In other words, that's saying that states are not subject to federal direction. Okay, that's what this whole issue was about. Can the federal government command me as sheriff to do whatever they say, even if it violates and forces me to violate the rights of citizens? Now, this is where Scalia starts saying that there's a, there's a difference between the state and federal government, but they ba basically have the same role. But that the states, if you look at the bottom, the states retained a residuary and inviolable sovereignty. If the states were inviolably sovereign, then why can't we run our own education? Why can't we run our own families? Why can't we run our own land, our water, air? Now, this was all based on the Tenth Amendment. There it is. He says Congress is not, is the conferral upon Congress of not all governmental powers, but only discrete enumerated ones. Don't you wish Congress knew that? Who is it in charge of enforcing state sovereignty, my good friends? It's us. We have to do it. Oh, I know. You're waiting for Barack Obama to choose the state sovereignty czar. They'll do it then. <laughs> That's probably not going to happen. To secure states' rights, state sovereignty and local autonomy, that's our job. Governors, state legislators, county commissioners, sheriffs, working together to do what? to protect the people and their rights. That's it. The great innovation, Scalia said, of this design was that our citizens would have two political capacities, one state, one federal, get the next line, it's in gold, powerful. 
each protected from incursion by the other. So in, when incursions come into your county, who's supposed to stop it? States, states, states. And Scalia goes on so far as to say also, the local or municipal authorities form distinct and independent portions of the supremacy. The states and counties and cities all share in this supremacy. Now, Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution details the few and enumerated assignments that the states delegated, as mentioned, the word de delegated in the Tenth Amendment, it is there for you and I to see how many authorities in law enforcement were granted to the federal government by the Constitution. No, it's not zero. Uh, felonies committed on the high seas or piracies, counterfeiting, uh, treason, and and they're supposed to protect our borders. Good job there, huh? So Arizona can't protect its own borders when the federal government won't do their job. Of course they can. All right, we're going to... Right here, we're going to end with this. This is Justice Scalia giving us the answer. He's talking to every sheriff in the country. Remember, this was a case brought by sheriffs against the federal government the Supreme Court sided with us. That last line is the solution to this entire problem. A healthy balance of power between the states and the federal government will reduce the risk of tyranny and abuse from either front. There's your answer. There's the solution. Let me ask you this one final question. Do we have that balance of power today? Even the sheriffs who are the most liberal in the country, please tell me, do we have that healthy balance of power today? Anybody knows that that's a joke. They kind of, without any regard of their, our Constitution or freedom of rights, they want to control every facet of our lives. And now they want to take over our health care. And now they want the President of the United States through the NDAA to be able to use the military and treat us or any American citizen who they deem to be a terrorist to use the military against them and put them in Guantanamo or Gitmo just like they do any other terrorist. That power has now been granted to the President of the United States and I'm asking you how and where and when do we stop it? The states are how we maintain freedom and the balance of power, and the officers therein, the sworn constitutional guards, my dear sheriffs, my brothers-in-law, <laughs> it's our duty. Let's take a break. Be back in 10 minutes. <laughs>